Hi, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for joining. Just give everyone a couple of minutes and see people still connecting to audio. So. Great, so we've got some more people in the waiting room, but um, I'll just keep letting them in as we uh, get going. Thank you all very much for joining us. I'm very excited uh, to present this session to you. Um, we've got three speakers today who are from CARA, um, and they're gonna tell you a little bit about the organization and what it means to um, academics in the UK and abroad. So I'll hand over to Stephen now to do introductions. Thank you very much. If I can just click on a screen share and take that and then launch that. Okay, so that will click forward by itself as I'm speaking. Uh, well, hello, welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, this is the, the CARA session of the University of Sanctuary uh, 2020 conference. Uh, I'll be the host for the, for the session and the first of the three speakers. Uh, as Abby said, this is being recorded, just a reminder. Um, please also observe the standard good, good Zoom etiquette and uh, don't interrupt. And there's a chat function uh, for questions and so on. Um, you can put those in as we go along. Uh, I will speak first, um, then Sheila Mills, our Scotland manager, will, will speak. And then finally, Zaha Albakor, uh, one of our Cairo fellows uh, currently at the University of Aberdeen, will speak. These slides will just click forward as I'm talking. It'll just give you some idea of, the, of what Cairo is and does or has been and, and is now. Uh, some of you know about CARA already, uh, some, some do not. Uh, we were founded in 1933 by academics and scientists in the UK in response to the Nazis coming to power and uh, expelling German academics, particularly German, German Jewish academics initially, from their posts at German universities. So it was a rescue mission from the beginning and the aim was to help people and raise funds to support them uh, while they found new jobs either here in the UK or passed through the UK onto somewhere else where they'd be safe. The, our founders saw the, the mission as really having two parts, which they defined as the, the, the relief of suffering and the defense of learning and science. And those two elements are really still what, what we're doing today, almost 90 years later. Uh, clearly, uh, the focus has changed. Uh, what was originally very much focused on uh, Europe and fascism uh, is now worldwide. Uh, we are open to applications for support from anybody anywhere. Uh, who is suffering from persecution or violence or conflict. Uh, this is the work of our, of our fellowship program. Uh, they are essentially people at immediate risk. Uh, we do not deal so much with people who now are already in the UK. In fact, CARA a few years ago, uh, the full version of the acronym was Council for Assisting Refugee Academics, but we changed it in 2014 to Council for At-Risk Academics because that refer did reflect the focus which has shifted from uh, people had certain uh, st status here in the UK uh, as refugees to those who were actually still at immediate danger, in immediate danger from violence, from a risk of, risk of arrest because of what they would said or written uh, or a whole range of other things, including often uh, just, just who they were, um, being gay in a society where that can get you beaten up or killed, for example. Uh, so really people contact us from wherever they are. Um, we work with a network of 121 UK universities who help us by providing places and financial support uh, for us as an organization, but also for the fellows they're hosting. Uh, of course, not all universities can uh, afford to pay the full costs. So in some cases, uh, we will raise funds ourselves and contribute to the fellowships. And people come here, and our definition is that somebody needs to be an, an academic. And we define that as somebody who has held a teaching or a search post at the, in their own country. Depending on their country, that may mean that they're postgraduate and about uh, postdoctoral. And most, about 70% of our people are um, at postdoctoral level, but about 30% are postgraduates and people who held maybe a first academic job when they were still uh, had a master's degree, a master's degree or even just a bachelor's degree. So they come here and need to do postgraduate qualifications before they can really begin an academic career in the sense that we would understand it. Uh, the other main program we run is uh, currently our third regional program. Um, this is for Syrian academics in exile. Uh, we had our, our first regional program was in 2006 for Iraqi academics and worked through an, op an office in Jordan. Uh, our second was focused on Zimbabwe. Uh, the Syria program is mainly for Syrian academics in exile in Turkey, though uh, some who are in exile in other places are also involved. Um, and it provides a whole range of activities um, 
English academic purposes, academic skills development, um, short term research incubation visits here to the UK, uh, then research projects. The whole idea being to help people not only not lose the skills they've already got, but also develop those skills further and connect them with colleagues in the wider international academic community. Uh, in all this, we do rely enormously on support from UK universities in particular, but also some others. I mentioned earlier about um, hosting fellows, but also, for example, in the context of the Syria program, there are around 240 UK academics who are individually giving their time freely uh, to act as mentors or as uh, principal investigators, uh, assisting with research in a whole variety of ways. And again, without them, this simply would not function. Uh, so we value that support enormously. Uh, we work very closely with uh, other organizations. We have two counterparts in the United States, uh, the Scholars at Risk Network and the Scholar Rescue Fund, which is part of the Institute of International Education. Uh, we are the only sort of European organization of, of, our, of our type uh, engaged in this work. As I said, said earlier, we have, we have quite a long history, but you know, we are always looking for uh, support from people who want to work with us uh, because sadly there is never a shortage of things to do. Um, we have a constant flow of applications uh, from people who are in very difficult circumstances. Uh, we work with them and from our point of view that the real pleasure is in seeing them progress, um, get the qualifications if they need them, get experience, get publications in peer-reviewed journals and really start to build an academic career and always with the idea uh, that at some point they can return because, as I say, they're coming here from the outside, they come on regular visas, um, and their intention is you know, when they can, they want to go back, because they, most of them understand very well that it's almost a sense of like, you know, it's their responsibility, that's what they feel. Um, that is, their societies have had enormous troubles, and they will need rebuilding, uh, and when that moment comes, then it's really for people uh, like them with an education to go back and, and help with that rebuilding process. Uh, We've been working with the University of Sanctuary now for some time. I was at the conference at York St. John. Um, there is an overlap clearly between uh, the work that the University of Sanctuary does to, to raise um, or to encourage sanctuary scholarships, including for, for postgraduate students, and the fact that we have some, some postgraduates as well, as, as I mentioned, about 30% of our fellows. The only th request from our side, really, and we welcome the whole process because it raises awareness of the problem and willingness to help, um, but we Sometimes you do find some universities in defining the the limits of their sanctuary scholarships focus very much on people having a certain status granted by the British government. You know, they have to be a refugee. They have to have been a humanitarian protection program. Uh, I would only say if you are setting up such a program, if you can leave that a bit flexible, uh, because clearly from our point of view, uh, we have people who are not uh, don't have that sort of status, uh, but they are certainly seeking sanctuary. That's why they're here in the first place uh, and they need help. And it would be great if some of these awards that are being set up could also be available in principle for, for uh, CARA fellows as well. That is not in any way to deny the, the importance of uh, awards being available for people who are refugees or uh, have been forced to seek asylum. Clearly, they need help too. Uh, and it's a, it's a very wide uh, community of people that we, that we want to support and want to help. Uh, I will call a halt there. I think, as you see, the slides are almost finished. There are a few at the end. Uh, of our current fellows in different positions and uh, what they've been doing. Um, but I know I'll pass on now to uh, Sheila Mills, our Scotland manager, who will give, give the view of, uh, give the view from Scotland and what she's been doing there. So I'll pause and pass on. Okay, thank you, uh, Stephen. That's, that's great. And I shall just share my screen just now. And hopefully that will work. If yours is finished sharing. Oh, it doesn't seem to want to share <laughs> for some reason. Uh, let's try that again. Technical pitch. No, my screen doesn't want to share, I'm afraid. Uh, let's try once more. There we go. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, share that with you. Okay, uh, so let's just go back uh, to uh, 
So, um, morning everyone. Um, as Stephen said, my name is Sheila Mills and I'm the um, Scotland manager. Um, I have been working for the last two years as the Cara Scotland manager at the University of Edinburgh. Um, the university is a founding member of Cara and funds and hosts the post. Um, I have been involved in managing and developing Cara's partnerships in the higher education sector. Um, in research communities and uh, learned societies and civic society groups. Um, so I've been uh, traveling around Scotland before COVID obviously, but uh, maintaining that relationship online now, but discussing with uh, universities how they might start to collaborate or expand their collaboration with CARA. Um, and I've been working very closely with the universities of Sanctuary, um, in particular Goon Organ, um, the Scotland coordinator, um, for the um, City of Sanctuary. And um, Gunn has organised a Scottish network of universities. Now, we're a small sector. There are 19 higher education, sect, uh, higher education institutes. So we're quite a small sector, but we're very collegiate and we've been working together um, uh, on university sanctuary applications. So we have two universities who are currently uh, universities of sanctuary, um, that's Edinburgh and St Andrews. And um, we have been sharing experience and um, expertise in um, helping people with that application. And obviously I've been part of that and um, explaining to people what they can do with CARA. Now, sometimes those involved in the University of Sanctuary application for their own university are uh, unaware of the current involvement with CARA. So not just um, perhaps hosting a fellow, but the fact that there are academics within the university who are involved in the Syria programme perhaps involved in delivering workshops, research incubation visits, English language teaching, mentoring, and even sometimes in donation of laptops. So there's a whole host of ways in which um, universities can get involved with CARA that's above and beyond um, hosting a fellow. Um, I think one thing I would say about um, hosting a fellow is that um, having listened to some of the events yesterday, it's very much the same process um, as for um, uh, introducing um, a, a, a student to the university who's come through the sanctuary um, scholarship route. It's very much about helping them with that transition to a new academic environment and um, support in transitioning to life in the UK. So there's a lot of overlap there. So there's a lot of learning that we can share. I think what I would also say is that there are so many universities in the UK involved with CARA um, and yet um, not many of them have it front and centre on their university website. So that's something that we have done at the University of Edinburgh and um, we have put that uh, CARA logo and our support for CARA up there with our University of Sanctuary status um, and the other work that we're doing in this area of access to higher education for, um, for those seeking sanctuary. Um, and it would be great to think that people could also uh, hold awareness raising events within their universities. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is just this slide um, about the fellowship programme and the journey of a fellow. Um, and this um, uh, flowchart um, I can share with you in the chat function. It, it's uh, also in our latest annual report and I'll put um, the link to that in the chat function as well. But I just wanted to share that with you to show you that there is a process of admission in the same way that there is for sanctuary scholarship and that journey of a fellow. Um, and what I wanted to do was just to really share that with you um, and then I'll stop sharing. Um, and I thought it would be good to pass over to Zahir, who will then tell you about his journey and his experience um, in Scotland. So over to Zahir. Thank you very much, Sheila. Thanks, Stephen. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this great opportunity today uh, in this conference. And I will share my screen as well because I've got some slides to share. Okay, uh, so. So basically, basically, when every time I start my presentation, I always think about what sentence that can, that can, that can uh, summarize everything in one sentence. So I would say that you are the hope where no hope exists. Everyone, everyone who is working on this sector uh, is involved in, in, in that as, as I see. I see that I'm, at some point I had no hope at all. And then out of a sudden, a hope came out from the UK and from CARA to be specific uh, to help me out, to get out. And, Basically, currently, I am now a final year PhD student 
uh, the University of Aberdeen doing working on in, in biomedical sciences, basically. So just to give you a pr very brief about, about, about my very brief story. Uh, so this is my city, Aleppo, in uh, Syria. So my background as a, I am a pharmacist and I lived in Aleppo till 2016. And I still remember our city was uh, buzzing with life and uh, the life there was, was fantastic, basically. And our life at the university was, was 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 great basically so i still remember I still remember our football team and playing football matches or basketball matches or even like doing hiking and playing music playing music in, in, in the on the mountains and then having 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 like having workshops big workshops for the whole class and and doing all these activities all these memories i still have them and then they give, still give me a smile up till now every time i remember them but like the photo in the middle means a lot to me because these are my friends. And this is with, with one of our trips into the forests and the mountains of Syria. And it means a lot to me for one reason that every one of these friends, everyone in this picture now in a different country, everyone escaped the country and including me. And we don't know if we can take the same picture at any point in the future. And that was due to the fact that the war started in Syria, and this is Aleppo now in 2012, how it was, and uh, it was a devastating war, and then it didn't exclude any city or any street or anyone. Everyone was affected to some extent. And I still remember spending nights and days just, just, uh, just being hiding in my flat, and then and then I still remember because Aleppo city was, the conflict was almost in every street, and then you can hear fighters just outside your flat uh, having a fight. And just to give you a sense of how it feels like, I'll just play a very short recording, how it feels like when you are hiding in your flat and then there is a fight outside going on. And so I would, I would, I would ask everyone if it's possible just to close your eyes and imagine there is a fight now going outside. And then I would play a very short recording to show you how it feels like. So here we go. So that's, that's just a very quick recording of how it feels like when you are hiding and then there is a fight outside and hopefully no one would experience something like that because, because uh, the feelings you get that you are hoping that nothing will happen and nobody will just invade your house for, for, for a reason or take your house as a, as a, as a fighting point. And among all that, like any 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 country that goes that goes for under 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 war, so the basic needs such as water or feed is very very limited, and then you have to work so hard to secure them. And I remember spending spending days, hours and hours queuing with these people just to get some water for me or my family. Even even at university, universities weren't excluded from, from, from that fight. Like this picture was taken from an explosion that happened at university. That was very close to the building at the same moment when we were doing an exam. I was doing an exam at that point. And then out of sudden, an explosion happened. And then the ambulance came in. And then uh, there, was, there, there was a huge, a huge like shock among everyone. And because the city was, that was happening constantly, the exam wasn't stopped or suspended. We were given 10 minutes extra just, 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 just to, to keep our exams going. Uh, and this is this picture, you can see in this picture, people are running to cross that street and they are running for a reason that this street is under snipers target. target. So snipers just shoot people, everyone who are running in this street because it, it links the two sides of the city and you are not allowed to go between two sides of the city. And I still remember uh, me and my sister, we had to cross that street. And my sister had a, uh, a baby, she, he was two years old and I had to carry that baby and, and cover that baby with my body and then run with him through all that street to avoid being shot with uh, sniper shoots. And the feeling, I won't forget that feeling, uh, whatever happens in my life. And this picture as well, it, it, I, I still have a memory with this picture because this picture was taken from the primary school I used to go to. The school was turned into a fighting point and, and the, 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 the military groups used it as a fighting point to scan the other side of the city and then take it as a, as, as, as a place to hide 
and a sneak in the city. So among all that, I managed to graduate with a pharmacist degree and was, was so happy about that. And, uh, and I managed to secure a placement with the University of Aleppo and to start lecturing at, at uh, quality control labs. And then I, I, managed, I managed to secure a placement with, uh, with a pharmaceutical company as well as a manager for, to, for, for the quality control manager and, and research and development. It was, it, it, it was great achievement for me, but even that achievement wasn't that easy. This is a photo of our, of our pharmaceutical plant there. And it shows the destruction that happened after it was targeted by air forces. Again, I, will, I want to ask you again about, about how it feels like when you are there and then you hear that there's our air forces in the sky and then they are dropping missiles and bombing the areas underneath. So I would ask you again, if, if, if you don't mind, just to close your eyes and imagine there are air forces trying to drop some bombing into the area that you live at. Sorry. Yeah, uh, so that is that's how it feels like basically. Uh, I still remember when when one attack happened, we all just lied on the floor, uh, we put our hands on our heads, and we were just hoping that it's not going to be our building. It's going to be the building that is next to us or slightly away from where we live. And and we many people sacrificed their life just because they wanted. They they had no option. They had to work to secure. Uh, their, the food for their families and, and, and just for their life. Among all that situation, I tried my best just to, peace, to secure safety and then go out of my country. And I applied for any single opportunity that appeared all over the world. I didn't exclude any country from my applications. And I never, I never heard any reply from anybody. About two replies saying, oh, we have got your CV. Thank you very much. But one, one, one reply that made the whole difference which was from the council for at risk academics, Cara, where, who said that you are eligible for our support. And I didn't believe that happened. I didn't believe that somebody is actually talking to me or saying we are going to help you. I didn't believe that. They managed to secure me a master's degree at the University of Aberdeen. And then, and then they asked me if I would agree to go with that, with, 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 with that option. And I was like, oh, that's, that, doesn't, that, that question doesn't make sense because I will go with any opportunity that might come up. And they managed to secure a placement for me just with, 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 with the thing that I really like and I am passionate about like pharmacology and clinical pharmacology. I managed to get that and then graduated, started my PhD afterwards. They continued their support with my PhD. And then my life now is just like that. Now I am involved in public engagement events with, uh, with public engagement about, about physiology and then attending conferences and seminars, presenting my data and then going with the schools to, 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 to engagement events as well with the school on science day, having birthday parties, winning prizes, and then contributing with the societies and the Young Academy of Scotland as well. So my life has completely changed from the life that was completely at risk and to the life that is now completely now I am I'm 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 driven with the passion with what I'm passionate about and the opportunity the great opportunity that I will be grateful for until the end of my life it's but I still keep in mind that within that opportunity I could have been forced to be with the military forces because it's compulsory to be with these forces and I could have been forced to fight with them the only option to escape that was to seek and hiding into rural areas. And these areas are in the, under constant attack. So I could have been escaping with my families from one place to another, just taking safety. And the only safe place could, I could have had was just being a refugee campus and seeking refuge into the, 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 into the countries that are close to Syria. And then that means that would put an end to my life and my my skills or my passion about doing basically anything. And sometimes I feel like I don't mind going into all that process and then risking my life or just if, if it only matters to me. But what matters most for me is that my baby now safe. 
and then she is having a safe place, safe place and safe life. And then when I go to work, I know my baby is safe. And when I come back, I can see my family and my family can see me. And that is priceless for me. So just, in, just, just to conclude that, like what Cara and the University of Aberdeen did to me was just they completely changed my life from life full of risk and danger to the life full of achievements and success. And whatever I say, I won't be able to thank you enough. So thank you to the moon and back. And I will hand back to Stephen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Sheila and Zaha. Uh, we've come in on pretty well on time. We aim to speak for about half an hour, and that, we've done that, uh, which leaves us about a quarter of an hour for any questions. So please, if you have questions, uh, don't hold back. Anything that we've raised, or indeed anything we haven't raised, you want to talk about. Just... I had a question just to, to kick off. Um, I wonder whether you could just talk a little bit about the um... English language side of things and when you get applicants how you assess that how kind of important it is that people are fluent and, and those sorts of questions yes I mean, obviously it's, it's, it is a question uh, it's a very important one because if someone's coming here to do a, do a regular course and as a postgraduates then there's certain standards they have to meet uh, as set and in that situation we and some can meet the standards already and have got the relevant um, IELTS score or whatever uh, in some cases they haven't because they haven't had the opportunity they may have some English but not enough uh, I think it's quite difficult if somebody has none at all we can't really you know, help them from scratch but where people need a bit of help then again we go back to our university partners because there are a number of universities that are very keen to to host and to help uh, but perhaps can't afford to take somebody on particularly with a family for a full three years but can do uh, help with a, say a three-month or six-month pre-sessional course which usually only involves the one person uh, because you can't you normally get a visa for accompanying family for a pre-sessional course so that can make the difference they can get their score up to the relevant level uh, postdoctoral is a bit more flexible but again people do need a, a good standard of English to be able to function and, and that is something we always test uh, and as part of the process when somebody uh, applies for support um, there's a very detailed process, and it's detailed, but I hope not too burdensome uh, online, uh, where we ask a variety of questions and need to see various documents and references and so on. Um, but we also obviously talk to people. Um, we talk to them in English. We have some staff members who speak Arabic, so we can switch into Arabic if there's a problem and try and gauge whether they need help. Um, but yes, I mean, we, we'll, we'll help where we can. Uh, but again, that's where we need our university partners to, to support us. Uh, Zaha, do you want to say anything about your experience of English? Where did you learn your English? I never asked you that question. Oh, there. You're on mute. You're, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, like, like at, you, at, at school, they, they teach us some about letters and then some about, like, grammar, grammar basics, but, like, the skills about speaking and listening, I had to develop this through my own and... Uh, uh, I had ba basically, basically, when 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 I when when I submitted to Cara, I was already working over a year about developing my reading and then listening skills and preparing for the IELTS test. And then and then I had just to practice speaking because because I couldn't afford to do the full courses. I had like a mirror in front of me and started just speaking to myself or just uh, just practicing that. And then. I went, I went, I, I went, I did, I did uh, the, the, the test in Lebanon and then just before the test, I heard a lot of stories about students who failed the test like five times, six times, and then that didn't help at all uh, for someone who is coming with, from, from, yeah, from very basic, uh, from, from very basic background doing that test. But I passed it from the first time and I was very, very, very grateful about that. This is, it worked out basically. Good. Thank you. And do you normally find that the uh, other academics in the institution are receptive? How much involvement, are, I'm aware that we have a mix of university staff and university academics in the audience. So what's the role do you see of other academics in kind of welcoming or maybe doing any of the kind of reception type? Roles? Well, there's a whole range of things. I think mean, clearly people need a, an academic supervisor. Um, but also a lot of other people at universities, both academic and non-academic staff, are very much involved with the process um, as mentors and hosts and generally helping people find their way around, particularly where there's a family involved. Uh, and many of our fellows come with a partner and with children. 
Uh, so the whole range of issues straight away about sort of what the partner's going to do, where the kids are going to go to school. And for that, it's really helpful to have people already there who can you know, essentially take charge of it and, and, and help. But I mean, Sheila, you mind to say a bit about Scotland and how that's been working there? Yeah, I mean, so um, when the when the fellow starts out on their journey, they have um, a point of contact um, with with Cara, but then there's also um, a point of contact in the in the host university. Um, and although lots of different people, um, see uh, in the HR department, the academic supervisor, etc., are all involved. It's really good if we've got one person who's kind of looking after more of the pastoral side of things and helping with that transition. So um, in Scotland, I've, I've been involved very much in that kind of role, helping with finding longer term accommodation. So searching for um, flats for people, um, looking at schools, um, looking at um, the transition maybe from, from school into college, um, you know, all those things that... Um, it's very difficult coming to a completely new uh, place, a completely new academic environment, completely new living environment. Um, and so having someone that, um, that you can go to and having one point of contact, I think that's been mentioned a lot in, in the, the past uh, days, just having one, one person that people can go to or even a couple of people who are designated to help um, can be really important. Just you don't have to know all the answers, but you can help to signpost. Um, and I think that's really crucial. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we have a question here from Pascal that says, uh, do, does CARA work with the Syrian Resettlement Scheme? Is resettlement Scheme, is that this the um, Humanitarian Protection? So yeah, the Vulnerable Program. Persons Resettlement Scheme. Yeah, uh, not directly. When it was launched a few years ago, and the numbers were quite small, and the conditions were really quite specific, of the sort of situation people had to be in, which it didn't really fit with the sort of people that we're working with. Uh, who are neither very young nor very old, and uh, so, so some things like that. Um, no, I, we don't really get involved in government schemes very much, and we haven't ever done in the past. And it's not a matter of choice; it's just there hasn't been a scheme to engage with. I actually used to work on the Syrian, Syrian resettlement scheme, and um, people were coming with humanitarian protection and then refugee yeah. status, so they'd presumably already be uh, able to apply within this country. Sure. Yeah. As I say, the people we, we're helping primarily now through the fellowship program are, are not in this country when they're first applying. They're mostly in their, their own countries. In some cases, they've made it as far as you know, a country next door, but are still absolutely stuck and need help. Um, so we have um, another question here from Lydia. How can involvement with CARA holistically support the application process for universities of sanctuary accreditation in terms of changing attitudes to the plight of forced migrants in higher education? Right, that's probably more a question for you than for me, isn't it? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, certainly from our point of view, I, as I said before, I, the, we used to deal much more with refugees than we do now. Um, and that was indeed part of our name. Uh, we changed it because essentially we were dealing with, we had decided to prioritize, not because you know, we don't want to help refugees, but just we, we can't do everything. There were other organizations who were able to help them, but there was nobody else we could see who was actually able to, to link up academics who were still at immediate risk in their home country with the university here and then make the, make it all happen that they could actually get out of the situation they were in and, and get, to, get to safety. Um, but I mean, we, are, we are part of the wider, uh, team of people and organizations working with the problem of uh, highly qualified students, uh, academics, uh, some here, some not here, and trying to ensure that they all have the opportunity to uh, pursue their academic careers, to achieve their ambitions, uh, if and when they want to and can uh, to go back, because if they can't go back, then that's a massive loss to their country if all the best educated people uh, leave and never return. Um, but I, maybe you want to say a bit about your perspective from the University of Sanctuaries. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think I echo what um, Stephen says, is that it, it's about um, multiple pathways and it's about multiple um, different options for people depending on their situation. So for us, yes, it, it, the short answer is yes, it, it would add to a holistic understanding of what a University of Sanctuary would be. It's something that um, if a university is involved in can evidence um, and has you know, in many cases been doing for a very long time, um, something that we really consider within the, the application. Um, we've stopped short of making it a, a minimum criteria. I'm not saying that's a, a definite for you know the future, um, but it's definitely something that if you're involved in to put in your application and if you're not involved in would be something to maybe take to your working group or to your 
you know, senior management board or whatever as an, another way to become a university of sanctuary in not in the the award sense but in the the meaning of it so in, in order to evidence um your commitment to the kind of motivations that we both share i think and so we have another question here um Bryony says i'm conscious that i missed the start of the session so please refer me to the recording if this was addressed but would you like to say something about what universities should consider when setting the eligibility criteria for um, you said for scholarships but within kind of the understanding of car of yes well in, in terms of you know, sanctuary scholarships um in the broader sense uh, as i think i mentioned I, from our point of view we have absolutely no issue with the determinant of sanctuary scholarships because the people we're helping also need sanctuary um other people talk about for, forced migrants and again this is what the people uh, very sadly are and that applies equally to people we're helping who need to get away from their countries to come here but also the people we're helping for example through our regional programs currently our Syria program and they also have been forced out of their country um, in, in that case they've got as far as Turkey and then for various reasons uh, stopped there so yeah and I think the idea that people need sanctuary people need support uh, they have been forced to leave their, their home countries their careers their universities uh, where as I was saying in my comments earlier uh, we would like universities to think a bit about leaving things fairly flexible uh, is not then defining the term forced migrant too specifically in terms of people who have been given a certain status by the British government or in an, an, a refugee process uh, and why narrow it down and the t from our point of view the, the terms forced migrant sanctuary seeker are absolutely fine uh, and that covers a very broad range and from the university's point of view I think and it's not for me to say really but I, it would from their point of view, it's probably best to, to leave themselves the flexibility that when they have an award they wish to give, they can look at a range of candidates and decide which one most or which ones most uh, best fit what they actually want at that time. Um, so we've got one that says, uh, how do scholars or academics abroad apply or access the inf information they might need about CARA? It's a website, essentially. Um, and if we have the process on the on the main on, on the home screen of the website uh, top right hand corner there's, there's a button which says get support there's another one that says donate that's how well that, that's, that's important too um but the one that says get support and that takes them to a, a very simple set of questions just to establish that they are what we understand as an academic and what their situation they are in the sort of situation where we think they're they're sort of qualified for our support in terms of that, that situation uh, and after that it just uh, takes them through the whole thing and we've just what what their qualifications are what their uh, what their risk is um, but maybe as Zaha, as somebody who's been through it, um, can you give your perspective? Is it easy to use? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It was, it was like uh, basically, it was very straightforward and then very active. I managed. I still remember. I managed. I, they managed to hold this, the whole placement and the visa and all the way everything within two months. And and that was that was because 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 the risk was quite high. And then they they responded so quickly to my application and then everything was sorted out in two months and when you say that to somebody they just they just like can't believe that nobody can believe this yeah and, and clearly from our point of view the, the, the biggest issue is that the, the, the getting the visa uh, mm -hmm. the university is the visa, visa sponsors we, we aren't a visa sponsor ourselves uh, and of course it then, then depends a lot on the speed of reaction of the the home office uk visa and immigration uh, if there are issues there, we are normally very successful. Uh, last year we had about 98% success rate uh, with uh, these applications we were involved with. The year before it was 100%. Now and again, one goes wrong. We, we do challenge it wherever possible. Uh, we have been to court twice in the last few years uh, for, for judicial review, won, won both cases. So yeah, and we, but that of course does, does extend the time it takes considerably. And of course, just recently, COVID has had, had a significant effect on our ability to, to get people here because for a while there was almost no international travel and the UK visa application centers are all closed. But, uh, and that fortunately is now uh, shifted a bit. We've got two more questions. Um, sorry, Sheila, did you want to say anything? I was just going to say, I think it's also important to say that um, whilst the main route is through the, the website, um, obviously people are at risk and, and sometimes are, are fearful that their communication is being monitored so that we have other ways of um, being able to communicate in an encrypted way with, with people um, to, to um, ensure their safety. Um, but the, the, the website is obviously the main route. So we've got uh, two more questions from one person saying, um, do you know any of do you know of any other sectors outside of academia working in a similar way to CARA? Could you see how other sectors could work like this? 
trying to think of other things. I'm quite sure what, what that would be. I know, for example, so pardon the dog in the background. Um, I know, for example, that um, there are some organizations that work to help artists who are struggling. There's a German, uh, the Martin Roth Initiative in Germany, um, and our US colleagues in, Schol in Scholar Rescue Fund have a, another organization, I think just the Artist Rescue Fund or something like that. So that there are some organizations which help specifically uh, artists uh, who are at risk and, uh, and need help. Uh, that's the first one that comes to mind. Yeah, I guess the other one is probably something like Human Rights Defenders. Um, yep, uh, sure. yep. With um, that, that specific group, group yep. for activists um, from mm -hmm. the European Union, etc. cetera. Yeah. Yes, it's those sort of at risk uh, jobs, isn't it? It's journalists, lawyers, those sorts of things yeah. might have something similar. Yeah, yes, I actually mentioned that. And we are in touch with the Law Society, who also have a quite active scheme to, to support lawyers who are. Uh, in trouble because they've tried to defend the legal system or the, the rule of law in countries where that doesn't make them popular. Mm -hmm. And the other question was, um, once CARA post comes to an end or studies finish, what do CARA fellows do next? How does uh, CARA support them? Yes, well, um, we, we joke sort of once a CARA fellow, always a CARA fellow. CARA fellow. Um, it depends again on, on visa rules to some degree. Uh, with Syria, there's a concession from the Home Office and has been since 2012 that Syrians in the UK can change visa category or extend visas without leaving the country. So it is possible for someone as Zaha did to come here to do a master's, then stay on for a PhD, uh, and then stay on for a postdoctoral year. Of course, that's going to change now with the new visa rules, actually, get a bit more liberal, they can stay a bit longer, uh, and then move into a postdoctoral uh, position if they can find one, and again, different visa category. Um, that's specific to Syria. Um, other countries, there are, so again, some slightly different rules, depends a bit on the country. Uh, Turkey, there's some other concessions. But uh, essentially, we will try and help people to, to move on. As I say, the, the aim, uh, our aim for them and their aim, as we understand it in most cases, is, is to return home as and when they can, but maybe quite a long time. So in the meantime, it's a question of how we can help them. So moving from postgraduate to postdoctoral, we have links with um, organizations abroad in France and Germany. There are uh, the POURS scheme in France and the Philip Schwartz Initiative in Germany, which are essentially funding mechanisms for uh, supporting people at their universities in their countries. Uh, we have uh, links with our, I mentioned our US partners. Currently, we have people in uh, like Canada, Australia, uh, Germany, Malaysia. We did have people in someone in Hong Kong, but that's yeah, not so great just now. But we'll, we'll see. But essentially, we'll, we'll support people to try to move on. Um, they may need some financial support still, they may not. Uh, but we have a number of alumni who keep in touch with us because they they value the link and even if they don't actually need practical support uh, at a given moment, they might in the future um, if something changes in their lives. So uh, we have quite a wide, quite a long term connection with, with our fellow, fellows if they want that. Of course, if they um, find a job and just want us more, more to say goodbye and get on with their lives, that's fine. Yeah, could I just add uh, something to Stephen? Like, I find I find that Ikara was running some workshops about how 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 to adjust your CV and then how you can secure jobs. And then they are not only they are not they, they are I, I see they have they have helped me they have helped me to build my skills to prepare how to seek my my anyway is really helpful as well from from that perspective. Yeah, I, one of the benefits of COVID, if you can put it that way, uh, is that a number of workshops we're going to do as physical events um, to help people to sort of find their way around the UK higher education system, prepare them, you know, uh, document CVs and so on, and, and think about getting a job. Um, they turned into online webinars, and those are now all on our, on our website. In fact, if anyone goes to our website, there's a box at the bottom which says videos. If you click on that, there are some general videos, but also training videos. And those are all still there. They're quite recent. And uh, anybody who's interested, um, and they're just as valuable, I, I'd hope, for people here with um, refugee status or whatever, uh, who are looking to find their way around the UK higher education system and then prepare themselves for finding a job. That leads us quite nicely on to our last question. Um, which is for user here. It says, what advice would you give to Syrian refugees struggling to adjust to life in the UK? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it is, uh, I can see, I can see for some refugees, uh, the main, the main, I mean, the main challenge that they face is just uh, the, the language. And so once, once they cut that over, I mean, uh, they will be, uh, whatever they do, it will be greatly appreciated and it will be, it will be, they can reach their goals and then, and they can reach whatever they want to. I mean, I see the country here is the country of opportunities and appreciation. Uh, 
everything that I aim to do something, I always see, find help from somebody and find people who are going to support and find the care, love, and everything that you need to resettle in the UK is there. You, the only thing that you need to do is you need to find it and seek like many, 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 many schemes that are there to help regarding the language, regarding like starting a very small idea about starting a small job or establishing in a small business. There are a lot of schemes and it all can be reached out. Uh, the only thing that they need just to be patient and then and then do whatever they can just to reach that out and then it, they will reach it. I'm sure everybody works hard on this. It will be greatly appreciated and help is there from every city that yeah, I've, 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 I've been to. So I can see all the councils and everyone here is just doing amazing job just to get the help for refugees and it all depends on them basically. Great, thank you. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you for everyone who attended and thank you to our panel. Thank you. And thank enjoy you. your lunches. Thank you, bye. Thank you.